Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Suter. I'm the founder of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. Uh, thank, you, thank you all. This, welcome to our ATARC's Thursday afternoon lunch IT webinar series. I think we've done these maybe 80% of the time since, uh, since we all started uh, working from home, I think around, around the middle of March. Uh, but today we're really excited. Uh, got a great program for you. Uh, we're going to talk about how government uh, leaders are implementing new technologies within their agencies to keep their teams access secure during the time of telework. Um, I'd like to welcome all the attendees. Once again, thank you for taking the time out of your day. Um, I would like to thank Elena Neal, uh, Tommy Cathy, and the rest of the Ford Rock team, as well as Steve, for joining us today. They've been a great partner. They really believe in uh, security and identity management. They've been a good partner for us for a long time. So this afternoon, we're going to uh, hear from our panelists uh, we'll have some Q&A. Uh, we may pop in a poll question or two, keep things uh, moving, and answer your questions. So, uh, love to introduce our panelists real quick. Um, we got uh, David Tomas, Senior Advisor for the uh, for NIST. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing fine, thank you. Great, great. Um, and uh, we got we got his face. It's not going to be moving around too much, but we. Uh, we had a, we couldn't quite navigate NIST security on this one. So uh, <laughs> also we're going to have with us Ross Ford, IT specialist over at the CDM program. Uh, good afternoon, Ross. Hi, Tom. Great to be here. Yep. And last but certainly not least, we've got Stephen Jaros. Um, hopefully I didn't mess that up too much. Senior uh, Solutions Architect over at Forge Rock. Um, should be a great discussion. Uh, we want to have lots of questions from you. So we're going to have each of the panelists talk for a bit, and then we're going to have a, a Q&A period, which I'll, I'll let you on. So think of some great questions. Um, but before we get started, I think this identity management, and uh, I'm not an expert at it, but I think that this is one of the, one of the things that has really been an inhibitor to developing IT, mo you know, modernizing our IT systems. And I, I, I think we're getting closer and closer to solving a lot of these problems. And we've seen during pandemic, uh, you can't, uh, you know, wheel your 96 year old grandmother into the social security office downtown anymore. Uh, we have to have different ways to identify ourselves and help, help uh, citizens, help our government, help citizens get what they need in a very timely fashion. So without further ado, I think we have to start off um, with David to kick us off. Thanks, David, are you, Tom. Um, there you go. You get, Thanks, Tom, you and I'd like to. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, I was thanks. going to say, where are you, where are you today? Are you at the office? Oh. Or are you uh, at the home front no. in Maryland? Or? No, I, no, I'm home in Alexandria, Virginia. And just so the folks know, um, for security reasons, NIST blocks Zoom video conferencing. But I am able to call in over the phone. So you get to hear my voice, but you don't get to see me speaking. Um, I have a couple minutes to cover something that I want to make sure that all of the attendees are aware of. Um, we at NIST have responsibility, in NIST IT laboratories, have responsibility um, under the Federal Information Security Management Act for providing directions, guidance, and resources for the implementation of the act of FISMA. Um, and we do that through, through the issuance of special publications in the 800 series. This session was focusing on NIST special publication 863B, which is uh, authentication and authentication lifecycle. Um, but I want to call attention to some, some 863 3 resources that are available at the NIST Identity and Access Management Resource Center. Now, the Resource Center can be accessed just if you just look up and search for NIST Identity and Access Management, you'll come to the landing page for the Resource Center. The, the landing page is IT Laboratories uh, Resource Center for identity-related resources. Um, at the landing page, 
Uh, just a little bit of navigation to get to what I want to make sure you have access to. Um, when you get to the landing page, you'll see projects um, at the identity, NIST identity and Access Management landing page. If you click on projects, you'll see our IT laboratories projects. Um, and th they range across a number of different, um, a different uh, domains in identity and identity management. But at the top of that list is NIST Special Publication 863.3, the Digital Identity Guidelines. I'm not going to cover any of the other uh, identity-related projects. I want to focus on that one. So if you're, if you're following at home, or you want to, to access this later, you simply click on that project, NIST Special Publication 863, and you'll come to our landing page and our resource page um, for, for 863.3. And you see, you'll see there a number of different resources that are publicly available. Um, we post those for federal agencies but also for industry and for international use. Um, and the very first resource that's on that list um, is uh, entitled Special Publication 863-4, Free Draft Call for Comments. Um, and if you do access that, you'll see uh, uh, an announcement that we published on June 8th of this year announcing that we're, we're initiating a, a, a review for, co for comments on the current version of a special publication, 863.3. Um, 863.3 consists of four volumes. Um, this is not a primer on 63.3, so I'm not going to go through all, all of that. But the call for comments is for any of the, is, is, is for comments on any of the four volumes of the special publication. The comment period is open for 60 days until August 10th, so you still have time if you want to submit comments or points for our consideration for future revisions. Um, you'll see at that site the, where comments are sent. They're sent to our alias. Um, and this can be, these can be email submissions. There is no template for the comments that can be in text form, bullet form, however it's most convenient. You'll also see on the request for comments um, a note to reviewers. And the note to reviewers makes, a couple, makes the point that I just made that, that comments may submit, be submitted on any aspect of the four volume set but we have targeted nine focus areas where we're specifically asking for comments from federal agencies and industry. Um, though it is not a requirement to submit any comments or input on those nine targeted areas, um, these are areas that we want to stay up to date and current with the status um, in industry as well as federal agencies as well as some other um, aspects and some other topics that were highlighted in the current version of 863.3 for potential revision in the future. Um, and we'd like to get a sense of the, the timing for a, put, a, 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 a revision to 63.3 that might address some of those topics. So if you have not, I would encourage you to access that NIST Identity and Access Management Resource Center, access the request for comments, take a look at the topics that we're targeting for review, and if it's, if it's warranted, submit comments to us. Um, we are, we, there are some changes to the current version that we do want to make. Um, we are beginning the work to prepare a draft for what would be revision four to special publication 863. And uh, we encourage your participation and your submission of comments to that. I want to go back to the special publication projects 
special publication 863 projects page because there's two there's some other resources that i want to call to your attention on that page is another document it's the fourth one down the fourth bullet down called NIST special publication 863 3 implementation resources now the implementation resources are informational non-normative guidelines um, for the implementation of six of 863a identity proofing and enrollment 63b authentication and life cycle management, and 63C, federation and assertions. Um, the implementation resources are assembled by topic area, but there are specific links which link to the normative text in the special publication. To facilitate review, uh, we intend the resources to help both implementers um, as well as to provide additional understanding of the normative text in the special publication itself. As in all normative documents, the normative requirements in 63.3 always take precedence. The guidance are intended to be informational and to be used for that purpose. Um, you'll also see on the list of resources um, at the at, at the Resource Center for 63.3, uh, the resources entitled Conformance Criteria for Special Publication 863A and Conformance Criteria for Special Publication 863B. Uh, NIST was, is responsible for preparing conformance criteria for these requirements in these documents by the Office of Management and Budget Policy Memo, M1917. You can find that policy memo by number at the White House site, OMB Policy Memo, M1917. The conformance criteria present all normative requirements in 863A and 863B for assurance levels two and three. They present the conformance criteria in a standardized format. Um, in every case, each criterion presents the normative statement from the special publication, provides supplemental guidance to explain aspects of the, of the requirement that aren't contained in the special publication. Um, the, the supplemental guidance is intended to be informative, helpful guidance for implementers, as well as assessors or auditors that might be auditing for conformance to the requirements of the special publications. Again, these are FISMA documents governed by FISMA. Um, the conformance criteria also contain the assessment and the control objective. The, the, this explains what the control objective is intended to achieve as an outcome um, to, to allow for risk management processes if there are ways to achieve the outcome comparably to the normative requirement um, we want to ex explicitly state the requirement outcome um, so that the uh, implementers and assessors can see that. Each criterion also presents potential methods for conformance assessment. Uh, we are presenting that as informational guidance for assessors, auditors, agencies that are involved in FISMA, type, FISMA reviews uh, to, to, uh, to, for methodologies to be able to assess conformance with the conformance criteria themselves. And for some of the criteria, not all, some of the criteria, we Sorry. also present potential test methods. Typically, this is for functionality requirements that require functional uh, execution, um, that uh, conformity can also be determined by a functional test. 
some of the criteria have the have have uh, potential functional test methodologies as well. I want to call attention to these resources. Um, there is it, the the request for comments is time limited. Um, comments again are due August 10th. The other documents are helpful documents. I would encourage their review for anyone interested in this subject, 63B authentication, to review both the implementation resources and the conformance criteria. And as we go on in this session, I'm happy to answer questions that you have on the special publication or any of these resources. And I'll turn it back to you, Tom. Yep, thank you, David. I, I, I know I have some questions, but let's just move forward over to the rest of the panelists. Um, that was a great introduction, by the way, David. Thank you. I appreciate that. And one of the things that we'll do is we'll send a link out is a follow up for everybody. So don't worry about trying to find this link. We'll we'll get it for you and uh, make sure that you have that and, and definitely contribute, um, you know, especially with pandemic, which we'll get to a little bit later. There's a, a big need for for this publication to get as much input as possible. Uh, next, we are going to go to Ross Ford. Uh, how are we doing today, Ross? I'm doing great, Tom. Thanks. And where are you out of today? So I'm in the Shenandoah Valley, Virginia. Oh, my goodness. I, they have internet out there, I guess, huh? <laughs> yeah. Fios to the rescue, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, uh, thank you for coming today, and uh, uh, can't wait to hear what you have to say. That's great. Well, I appreciate it. It's great to be here with Stephen and David, both of which I've worked with over time. It's really a great panel you have, Tom. And I appreciate ATARC and Forge Rock putting this together. Uh, and let me speak a little bit about how CDM fits into this world. Um, I mean, for those of you who don't know, I'll give a little background on the program I'm on and then myself in that program. Uh, CDM is a diagnostic, the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Program. It started in 2012. Uh, and our, our uh, goal is to have a consistent approach to measuring the risk that agencies have in their environment uh, through a set of tools and, and continuous monitoring those tools uh, for the federal civilian agencies. And that's the, the, D, the CFO Act agencies as well as many of the small agencies. So there's over 100 agencies that participate under CDM. <clears throat> the way we go about our mission is uh, at, at the top level, we have a series of dashboards which are where, where this information is displayed. Uh, there's a federal dashboard that displays summary information so that uh, executives in the federal branch can see across the uh, across the federal government, the risk posture of the federal government, and then agencies have dashboards in their own agency that takes information from a number of, of tools and sensors. Uh, those tools and sensors are, are, are uh, defined in four different areas, and that's first area is asset management, the things that are in your, in your network, right, the devices and the systems that are in your network. Uh, and it's both hardware, software assets, and, it, and in regards to that, we, may, we measure the vulnerabilities and some configuration settings that are important to that. Uh, that we, we started this in phase, and that was phase one. Phase two was around identity and access management, and that's about the users and the accounts and the associated uh, attributes on those accounts that I'll talk about in, in detail later. Uh, the, the third element is network security and management, and this is pretty broad. It takes in everything from incident response to ongoing assessments. We'll be able to help with that and, and authorization, looking at boundary protections like, you know, filters into your network firewalls and perhaps some network segmentation and even a, a capability around building in security into your network. And all of that, it, at the heart of all of that is data protection management, and this is it was our fourth phase and it's the last emerging capability because you really need to have those other capabilities in, in place in order to be doing really good data protection management that's context context based and and can know specifically who should have access to what and and what under what conditions they have access to it so so that's the continuous diagnostics and mitigation program and i'll talk more about particularly my my area of expertise which is uh identity and access management. Okay, thank you for that, Ross. And um, last, but certainly not least, uh, Stephen. And where are you hailing from today? Yes, uh, today I'm coming from uh, Leesburg, Virginia. So the beautiful city okay. of Leesburg. Yeah, you're, 
<laughs> you're right down a, you're right down the street from where I live. So yeah. uh, thank you for thank you today. At least we have fairly good internet there. Um, we are the internet capital of the world there, right in Ashburn and Leesburg. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. love love to hear your perspectives from across government. Um, and then also what is where is private industry? Because I know private industry in this you know, in particular looks at NIST, looks at what the federal government's doing, but it'd be great to get your perspectives. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, so um, uh, I've been working in the identity and access management going on about uh, 20 years uh, through various different uh, vendors. I'm from industry where vendors such as uh, Netscape, Sun Microsystems, Oracle, and um, uh, currently at uh, Fordrock. And during that time, obviously, I also was tracking federal government from starting way back in the days of e-authentication, HSPD-12, and FICAM. So along with my evolution through identity access management, I've been growing up with uh, the vendor space industry as well as um, from the government, government's perspective, especially federal government. Um, with that, you know, we, we focus a lot on um, the topic of uh, concern, which is the 863B, the authentication, different uh, ways of authenticating, uh, single factor, multi-factor, risk-based, um, and when you basically, essentially, when when does it make sense to gather more levels of assurance or tighter levels of assurance for any given uh, particular transaction, and that's uh, that, that's really where we try to focus our solutioning and helping helping agencies out with that. Great. Um, and did you have a slide or something you wanted to present as well, or? Oh, um, I'm gonna do that. No, that's that, that's okay. I, yeah, I had okay. uh, there was a. No. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. No, 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 no problem. No problem at all. So, uh, probably the first question I almost have to start out with is is how how has pandemic affected your agency and uh, the way we look at identity management? I know a lot of agencies, you know, they were probably in one of three boats. One already had, you know, telecommuting. Uh, like a GSA, others were partial, uh, and some are, are in secure areas. So um, it'd be great to hear from your perspective, maybe starting off with you, David. Sure. Um, how is it, affect, it affecting this publication? I know you're, you're sitting around like talking about pandemic is, you know, I'd love to be inside the, inside the strategy rooms, it, it, the virtual strategy rooms, at least at NIST on this topic. Well, let me, let me talk about a specific issue here, which is how we onboard personnel in the federal government. Um, we, NIST IT Laboratories is also responsible for, uh, for, for the implementation of Homeland Security Presidential Directive 12, which calls for secure badging and onboarding of, of personnel into the federal government and the controls around accessing information as well as facilities um, using, uh, using uh, approved secure credentials. That program is issued under the FIPS publication, FIPS 201, which we are in the process of revising also, as well as 863.3. Um, but the challenge is across the government that uh, onboarding personnel under the FIPS 201 Personal Identity Verification or PIV program requires in-person identity proofing and enrollment processes. And clearly in the pandemic, um, we're precluded from, for health reasons as well as facilities access uh, from, from currently performing in-person identity proofing processes. Um, as a result, we've needed to move towards credentialing and pr processing and onboarding personnel um, using remote processes, but allowing for, and I'll, I'll use this expression, um, alternative credentials to the PIV, the personal identity verification card. We don't want to lower security on the PIV cards, reduce any of the identity proofing and binding processes to those cards, but 
Personal identity verification cards record biometrics, which means we have to perform an in-person biometric collection process, um, which right now we have to put on hold. Um, yeah. So this is this is uh, uh, enabled agencies to onboard personnel <clears throat> using, I'll call it alternative non-PIV credentials um, until yeah. such time as facilities can be open, we can open up secure sessions, so secure uh, s facilities to allow the actual intake process that we use for onboarding, which means those alternative cr credentials aren't gonna have the same types of permissions as you would with a full, fully onboarded PIV enrollment program, which requires additional steps. But nevertheless, these are steps that we've had to take um, from our purposes in the federal government in order to deal with the pandemic. And I can just say that we're in consultation with, with uh, organizations that are responsible for real ID, uh, Department of, uh, D of Homeland Security, for example, who are, using some of the processes that we use for remote identity uh, identity proofing for some of their processes as well for real ID because they're faced with the same situation as they're transitioning from the current driver's license on a nationwide basis to the real ID program, um, which similarly has an in-person proofing requirement. So this has this has stretched the capabilities and caught and required uh, innovative approaches, but maintaining secure approaches to the to both federal government onboarding as well as how they how states can go about transitioning to the real ID program. Thanks. Yeah, and Tom, I'll, I'll, <laughs> go I'll ahead, second, Rod. I'll second what Dave said. So at CISA, we had the same condition, right? And the OCIO at CISA, uh, you know, issued a memo and came up with a series of processes so that uh, people can get a, a derived alternate credential, right, for onboarding new hires that, and of course, they can't do the, the in-person uh, capabilities, so they do remote uh, capabilities, and they're issued a card that is not a PIV card, it's an alternate credential, but it has the strength of, all, of the authentication that the, that the PIV does. And when we uh, end this period, you know, we'll, we'll complete that, the HSPD 12 requirements and the 5201 requirements fully and have a PIV cards issued to these individuals. So just right now it's a risk management approach and that's the appropriate thing to do, right? The risk management framework is about making risk-based decisions in order to continue operations in the most secure manner possible, you know, given any conditions. Yep, and Steve, you wanna throw in on any of that? How, sure. how has your yeah. company dealt with this? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh from our you know, company perspective, obviously, we, we've had a lot of uh, remote work as well uh, over the years, but um, there are several of the offices. We have offices uh, globally, several of the offices, uh, you know, the, the people that attended those regularly had to have had obviously had to adjust. You know, we've had, um, you know, some uh, a lot of training and a lot more experience with uh, the um, uh, WebEx types of uh, things and Zoom type of things. I think I have uh, one of each of everything that's out there on the marketplace on my desktop. Um, but um, yeah, that, that plus, um, you know, we've been trying to um, kind of use our own technology as well and, and having things like uh, adding multi-factor to um, flows to ensure that you know, where people maybe have been typically in the office rather than issue kind of VPN access, instead start protecting um, uh, like with uh, more of a zero trust type of model as opposed to the old VPN type of uh, techniques. So things like that. Tom, I'd also like to add that CISA, you know, has been involved in the pandemic uh, response far beyond, you know, the parts I just mentioned around identity management, what sure. CDM is, is doing. You know, we have a robust team of, uh, of cybersecurity professionals that help advise agencies on any specific given uh, risks that they think they're seeing and there are new risks more you know or let's say risks have been mo modified uh, as we've been teleworking and CIS has been helping agencies attack those risks and in CDM in particular under the current set of task codes we had we have the ability to issue uh, uh, 
RFS as we call them, or, or contracts to get people to come help quickly, right? That was part of what we did in our modernization of our of our CDM program. And and we've we've been able to exercise those things in certain in certain positions. And I'm really proud of the of CISA as an organization. We're young, but we're growing fast and strong. And CDM for the vision that they had, you know, to put those kind of vehicles in place that we could help agencies when they needed it during such a, you know, a really big change in the architecture of how we do business, right? Uh, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, we're starting to get a lot of questions. One, David, I have for you, it'd probably be a quick answer, is an internet-based voice over IP call into a government contact center considered a digital transaction and subject to NIST 800-63? All right, 863 uh, B deals with authentication transactions. And these are authentication yeah. transactions over networks. and uh the which uh, i would i would in reference to the to the previous question the authentication processes in 63b are relatively unaffected by the pandemic because they are designed to be conducted over over remote processes and over networks um but the question was the, for the use of voice over IP or email as a means for authentication processes, and neither are allowed in 63B for as channels for authentication processes. And the reason is authentication uh, under 63B requires the claimant of the identity to be able to prove possession of the secret. And in either of those um, those channels, that proof of possession isn't really capable. So under 63B, voice over IP or email are not channels that are permitted for for secure authentication processes. Great, great. And I have another question. Uh, it's actually from a CISO that I won't name, but a really good uh, question that I I have not thought about, which I probably need to think about. Do you have guidance on how to mimic HSPD-12 with digital workers? You know, RPA unattended bots with Active Directory accounts. We, we're getting the hard ones here. We got a tough crowd. Does any, <laughs> anybody want to well, put anything into that? Yeah. Let, 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 me, let me answer that the best way that I can. And I, I'm, I'm, I, and I'm, I'm going to kind of punt on it. Um, uh, and the reason I'm kind of punting is because our guidance uh, for uh, uh, under uh, under HSPD 12 for FITS 201 deals with personnel uh, um, and personnel security, um, both for for onboarding, enrollment, and ongoing maintenance of those workers. Similarly, Special Publication 863.3, the Digital Identity Guidelines deal with people not devices so um so we we have groups that are working and researching within nist um for for both security standards on um iot and and i'll even get into iot identity related issues with for devices yep. um however we deal i deal specifically with, on the FIPS 201 side as, and, and the PIV program, and 63.3 on the digital identity guidelines um, are focused on uh, the identity and proofing and the identity authentication of individuals, of people, not devices. Great. Anybody else want to throw in on that? Um, one thing I would say, you know, it's Go ahead, it's, uh, it's kind of a uh, uh, yeah, the question to, from that perspective is a little challenging, I, I admit. But one thing I will say with the <laughs> way, kind of way how Fordrock views um, authentication in general is we do take into consideration uh, the concept that it could be a live identity, it could be uh, bots, it could be IoT, and in fact, we actually have. Um, uh, modalities and ways to authenticate each, each and every one of those and treat them a little bit different. Obviously, and what, what it does is those concepts of layering and um, uh, layering on uh, levels, you know, not, not uh, 
uh, like level of assurance one through three, but um, kind of more microscopic uh, uh, of that where you can start to trust a device, things like that. But yeah, that, you know, the way, but, you know, strictly speaking with the mimicking HSPD12, that's probably a different, different matter. Great, great, great. Um, well, Tom, you know, I, go ahead, Ross. From my perspective, uh, you know, we've had some agencies ask us to try to help them with some of the, those types of uh, authentication challenges. And, you know, as a as CDM, we haven't really attacked that yet. You know, right now we've been focusing on really supporting uh, the, the strong identity assurance of the PIV card and making sure that agencies are using that to the maximum extent they can and doing continuous monitoring to ensure that happens. We'll be extending that, you know, through derived PIV to mobile environments. We've been, CDM's been primarily looking at the on-premise environment and building out the hygiene in that environment. But as we move to mobile assets, then the derived PIV becomes directly applicable there. And we're, we'll be looking at helping agencies identify how they're doing their derived PIV properly on those devices. And, you know, then that takes us into, you know, mobile assets are used quite often in the cloud, right? And so how, yeah. how uh, systems interact with those, uh, those assets in the cloud, and that includes a lot of IoT, that'll be something that, you know, necessarily comes as an evolution on these other, on these other pieces. And, you know, it, there's needs to be some governance around that. And, and I do think that identity governance, some of these tools, rather, whether, whether they're human identities that we're governing or, or virtual identities, uh, they, they need to be appropriately governed with, uh, you know, finding ways to assert who is the person that's given the authority for this device to operate, right? right. Yep, yep. Uh, how about this? How about we sneak in Alyssa? Alyssa Cole's our event manager, and she's going to sneak in a poll question. Nice. Are you ready, Alyssa? All right. How confident are you in your organization's overall response to the pandemic? And in lieu of COVID-19, what has been your biggest issue your agency has faced? So we're going to ask a couple questions there. We'll get it, get it fairly quickly. I think we can, can close it up. Go ahead, Alyssa. I think that is a pretty good report card, I would say. Um, you know, it, it, it's changed a little bit. I think it, it's in the beginning, we all got working remote. I think we're starting to find out the challenges like David was alluding to. I still got to hire people. You know, the good thing is I can work remote. The bad thing is I got to do my job. And some of it, it it's very dependent upon interaction, physical interaction. Um, so I think that was kind of interesting. Uh, Alyssa, how about we do one more, maybe around identity management, a little bit more specific if we've got one. Okay, there we go. All right. Mobile and other non-desktop devices are priority. Uh, and then the second one is, uh, has the proliferation of telework had an effect on your zero trust strategy? Okay, now we're kind of getting somewhere. Okay, let's see some results. All right. All right, high priority, David. That's interesting. And, and it, you know what? The zero trust strategy, I think, is we just started a working group around that. Um, it, it's It's gone from something nobody talked about two years ago to be like it's on everybody's. If you go walk into a CIO's office, where well, you can't really do that now, but if you could, they would all have that on their on their whiteboard. So. Anybody want to comment on, on any of those findings? Was it surprising? Is it is it is it just this pandemic has focused us a little bit more? Yeah, I, I think um, I think it's interesting. The um, and you know we, we're definitely seeing that both not just in federal but in industry as well. Um, the um, uh, I'll say the mobile was higher than I expected. Um, so that's and and the, the t they kind of go hand in hand as well because zero trust uh, well to, to enable mobility. You have you have to start thinking about zero trust. So they, there's a definitely a correlation there. 
Um, yep. Yeah. I, 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 while I can't see the, 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 I don't have access to the poll results, uh, I would say that, that one of the things that has influenced uh, uh, our, our direction for FIPS 201, the Personal Identity Verification or PIV standard, has been interest in the federal government to move from the the credential form or broaden or let's just say broaden the scope of the credential form from the PIV card, an integrated circuit chip card, um, which in order to read the the data objects needs to be inserted into a smart card reader um, to access the data on the chip to be able to use, to broaden that scope um, and be able to provide for authentic, secure authentication processes using mobile devices. Um, and the Ross referred to earlier, the derived PIV credentials. We have a special publication, 157, that deals with how PIV credentials can, uh, can, be, can, can be extended to additional devices, mobile devices, um, along with the aspects of the PIV credentials, we've further been asked to broaden the scope even further and allow for federal, uh, federal credentials and federal authentication processes uh, to be enabled through additional types of authenticators or authentication processes um, for federal employees to broaden the capabilities of authentication processes. And we see that, uh, that circumstances like the pandemic and the remote working environment of everybody, uh, to, which is creating demand for those types of expanded capabilities, um, which both we are, we are building into our guidelines for both the FIPS 201 for the PIV program, and we've been, we built into the, into the guidelines for special publication 863.3 and the authenticator types in, in 63B. So uh, we, what we see is that type of remote network secure authentication processes being necessity, not just something that's convenient, but a true necessity building demand and building both better products on the product side, more secure products on the product side, and we're looking in the federal government as a result to be also affordable products on the product side. So um, we see uh, I, I, that's, that's definitely not an advantage of the current situations, but a reality of the current situation. Yeah, that's great. And, right. and you know, Tom, I, th I think puts a, you know, having these options are really great, right? The fact that 863, you know, decomposed what had originally been just, you know, four measures all glummed together into identity and, you know, authentication, federation assurance, and decomposing into component parts of identity assurance, authenticator assurance, and federation assurance, it gives us more flexibility to do what we need to do, but it also makes it harder to, to, you need to put governance in place to, to do the associations between those things. And so, uh, so consider the identity assurance, right? We can use that for other authenticators, but we have to be able to tie that that identity assurance around that strong authenticator is what I'm using to, uh, to, to issue another authenticator that I know the person that's going to use that other authenticator is the person we intend to have. So that's a, that's really a governance uh, challenge that, that we have, we have to take on. Right. And, and along with Great. that too, we, Great. Go we ahead, noticed Jim. that, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Along with that too, we noticed, um, you know, the, uh, you know, there's the registration process of obviously of the identity itself, the proofing process, but then there's the, how do I gain trust of each of the, the new authenticator types? Um, how do how and when do I use them in combination to increase um, any levels of assurance at authentication time at any given point in time, and to still have um, some flexibility there of choice? You know, if I if I lose a credential, is there another credential that I have had issued to me that um, uh, I'm able to use that one in, in in lieu of the other one? Like for example, if I lose my uh, PIV card. 
uh, is there something that can get, uh, you know, get me to at least some level of access uh, because I've already, um, you know, registered as part of a, another uh, onboarding process, uh, another credential type that's now trusted. Uh, so these are all things yeah. that we're we're working with customers and agencies to um, deal with. It's not just authentication; it's it's the pairing and binding of credentials and 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 multiple credentials now these these days. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, maybe a follow up to what you just were saying, Stephen. You know, COVID has meant the need to shift from PIV cards to alternative credentials. What has been that practice? And before we go, uh, Alyssa, can you come on? I'm going to introduce you to Alyssa. She actually is going to have to take this webinar to the end. I'm on travel and I have to go to some kind of COVID test and they're pulling me early and they're giving me a dirty look because I'm the only one on, on this upcoming flight that hasn't done it. So <laughs> we've been there, Tom. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy town. Thank you, Alyssa. So Alyssa will take us back. She was prepared. This may happen. So um, thank travels, you all. Tom. And uh, yep. Thank you. Hey, Alyssa. Wow, he just Hi. disappeared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so just so um, we are all good to go, let's do one more poll question yeah. um, for the audience. And then we will see, and then we'll wrap it up. So if everyone wants to go ahead and answer this poll, we'll keep it up for a couple seconds. Okay. And then if you guys wanted to go ahead and respond to it, um, does anything shock you? Or um, are you pretty much? Actually, I'm, Alyssa, I'm happy that, I mean, look, we know lack of IT resources is really a challenge, right? And, uh, and I think, you know, what I'll, I'll say is it's, it's been a monumental effort and I'm, I'm really surprised at how well the federal government has done. Uh, in doing telework across the board. I mean, it, you know, really, it could have gone a lot worse. And it just shows how many CIOs have been preparing, how many agencies have been moving out into telework already, right? Uh, and, you know, and it, I think it shows in, in the second. I mean, most people are satisfied that, that you know, their agencies doing what they need to do. And that's a good sign. Yeah. Stephen, do you have any comments on the results of the poll? Um. I guess it's either it's fairly even across the board, and it's uh, I guess not not too surprising. And I guess that, like you say, a lot of companies and a lot of agencies have been starting down the path of telework, and so then it was, uh, you know, all of a sudden forced. But um, you know, it had probably had not that preparation been taking place, the um, uh, results would have been uh, it would have been more challenging, I suppose. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we'll just do one more question and then we'll give you guys some chances to like do your last thoughts. Um, what ways do you think that it, your identity and access management has had to change due to COVID-19? So David, do you want to start with you? Okay. Um, well, as I pointed out, the, um, the processes that are that are specified in Special Publication 863B, Authentication and Lifecycle Management, are, are not really changed as a result of teleworking or the pandemic um, because it, they, those processes deal with authentication over networks, remote authentication processes. Where we do see impact is, as I've described, is in 63A where um, for the highest level of assurance, 63A, for those who aren't familiar, defines three levels of, of, of assurance. In this case, identity and enrollment, identity proofing and enrollment assurance. Um, consider those levels low, strong, and very strong. Um, and so for very strong identity proofing processes, it requires in-person identity proofing, face-to-face -face involvement, including the collection of biometrics. Um, and as, as I've pointed out, and Ross also pointed out, uh, in federal government, we've had to deal with changes in the way onboarding and in-person processes can be conducted. 
one of the things that's included within the scope of 63A, 863A is the a process for we call it's specifically called supervised remote identity proofing and supervised remote identity proofing provides comparable level of assurance to in-person face-to-face proofing but conducted in a remote environment um, it, the, con, there are controls that are specified for the types of devices, the types of video capture, the types of supervision that must be performed for that remote collection, um, uh, uh, and, and identity proofing process in order to enable those remote processes. That's in 63A now. Um, I, I would say that the challenge that we want to get feedback on, this is one of the questions, by the way, that I referenced in the RFC, targeted focus areas for the, for the comments, is um, we want to ensure that these processes remain, are strong enough, that the controls are strong enough to ensure comparability to in-person identity proofing, which means collection of biometrics uh, using strong presentation attack detection uh, capabilities, strong liveness tests for the for the the applicants in a remote session in order to be able to to, to provide strong identity proofing processes. I'll turn that back to you. Um, One, Ross or Stephen? Uh, yeah. Well, well. One thing I was going to add to that was. Uh, agreeing with um, uh, 863A is um, probably the one that most uh, you think of when you think of uh, COVID. However, what I what we've noticed is um, an uptick in alternative credentials, um, especially with multi-factor. So the need to have um, users with um, uh, being able to provide multiple credentials and um, in combination to get to higher assurance levels. And part of presenting those credentials and those alternative credentials are having them issued. And so one thing tying back to what David said is the 863A, that being the proofing, not necessarily, or not, I mean, not just being used at onboarding time, but also used as a mechanism to acquire that um, uh, root trust for, the, for a new, over, you know, digitally for a new credential being, um, uh, also being able to be trusted. Things like WebAuthn and FIDO, why do I trust that particular authenticator now? And it's because I can tie it back to a proofing event that, that has uh, just occurred. Yeah, I think I agree point. with Stephen that, 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 that you know, a better ability to bind the authentic, you know, better not, and it may just be, all the information may be there, right? It may be just adopting the information that we have into systems that can provide the assurance, right? That may, you know, the, the, the automated information assurance that that happened, right? The governance controls that that happened. But, but that is really essential, I think, Steve, right? That gives you the ability to take your strong authentication or strong uh, identity proofing and then use it as appropriate because there are other forms of authenticators that are strong, but you need to have that binding back to the, the, uh, the this root of, root of trust of the identity. I think that's a great point. Um, we'll go ahead and do maybe one or two more questions since we do have a little bit more time. Um, let me see. So if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A and we'll try to answer them right now. Um, this one is for you, Ross. How is CISA working on the Zero Trust Framework as it applies to yep. um, NIST? Great, great question. So, uh, I mean, CISA has, uh, uh, they have pilots already going on in Zero Trust architecture, right? Uh, and uh, they've been putting out uh, information around, particularly around TIC and the modernization of TIC as, rela as it relates to Zero Trust. In addition, CISA and CDM both, we participate uh, through the CTO office with, with, in, with uh, NIST and Nancy COE. Sean Con uh, Connolly is from our agency, is one of the authors on the, the, the NIST publication on zero trust architectures. And, uh, and in fact, if the uh, CDM has a customer advisory form, forum where we talk to all the agencies that are involved in CDM, and Sean and I gave a presentation about you know, how both uh, 
the work that's going on with TIC 3.0 and how CDM supports zero trust architectures, right? Uh, I mean, it's not to say that it, it doesn't have to change from the type of, of uh, evaluative nature that CDM has been doing. It will as these architectures uh, become more point uh, specific in the risk determination they do. Uh, you know, where you have a lot of transitions, you need to make make risk decisions at many points instead of kind of where it was at the point of entry to the to the premise, right? But uh, but we are interested in doing that. Uh, we're not participating on any pilots right now. We were considering that on CDM, but then COVID kind of took the steam out of doing that kind of a pilot. And we're helping agencies do other things related to COVID right now. But you can be assured that CDM is uh, paying attention to that. We're working closely with our partners to come up with how CDM can fit in that architecture. And CISA is a leader in doing both those things along with NIST. Perfect. Thank you so much for answering that. Yep. Um, so how about we go through, everyone can take about like maybe two minutes and maybe just give your closing thoughts about NIST and all of that type of thing, all of those types of things. So, I, just want, um, I want to congratulate oh. David first that you know, NIST has a, a, an extremely large uh, job to do. There is a lot that goes into identity and access management, and NIST has given us tools to navigate ourselves through it uh, well. I mean, in the governance model that we do in CDM, you know, we're trying to keep up with where they are, and they will keep ahead of us into what I need to do. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that agencies don't have needs beyond either of those things when they have a specific you know, need and and they make they can make their risk based decisions and they have when they needed to, right? Uh, such, such as the, the derived alt alternative credentials right now, right? Uh, but it, but uh, I really appreciate David who worked in a long time, and we really appreciate our our uh, partners in the commercial industry too, right? Because I could not do anything if there were not products that gave me the ability to do those things. We do not do GOTS. We take commercial products and put them to use in the agencies. And that is critically important to us. Yeah, for sure. Um, Steven, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, well, thanks. For, go ahead. Go ahead, David. Well, thanks, Ross, for those kind words. Um, what I would like to do is call attention to what I spoke of right off the bat. Uh, I would encourage attendees take a look at the resources that I, I described and access to those resources. Um, but in particular, because it's time limited, um, take a look at the request for comments. And if you have points, if you have input to us, um, the, the comment period is open until August 10th. So I encourage you, and obviously you're interested in the subject by attending this session. To, uh, to draw down the request for comments, take a look at the focus areas, see if you have, want to provide input to NIST. We take all comments very seriously and we do publicly post those. Um, so um, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the group and I'll turn it back to you, Alyssa, thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, Steven, do you want to go ahead and give your closing talk? Sure, yeah. And, and so um, one thing I will say, you know, one thing that we uh, we believe in, in the, uh, I guess, in the uh, on this topic of authentication is really being able to enable agencies to uh, uh, rapidly define a different authentication, um, what we call we call journeys and the, what that user experience looks like, uh, to be able to do that in a future-proof way. And the reason that's important is that the pandemic highlights that is what may be my authentication mechanism today may not be what it's going to be tomorrow, and I need to be able to uh, rapidly evolve. The other thing that also drives that is the really nice and rich uh, uh, ecosystem of authenticators. There's so many different authenticators to choose from. They're, they become better and better. And, you know, if you needed to rapidly switch one out because of a particular authenticator becomes compromised, that ability is something we think is very powerful for agencies to have is to uh, uh, rapidly define and redefine that authentication experience, which also includes the registration part of that. Perfect. Um, does anyone else have any last minute anything before I close this out? Elisa, I'd like to offer if, if you if there's any questions that you have from that we even have an answer from the Q and A, if you could forward those to us, I'd appreciate that. We can answer people if if, if, we, if they give us our if you, if you can do that. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so that is all the time we have today. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, also, thank you to Fordrock for being an awesome partner. We always look forward to working with you guys. Um, join ATARC next week as we host an internal government um, agency, um, private industry and academic committee titled the ATARC um, AI and Data Analytics Working Group. Um, the ATARC and AI Data Analytics Working Group is led by our IT thought leaders within the government, academia, and private industry, and it promotes collaboration and thought leadership within the federal IT and data AI community. The data working group includes project teams such as a predictive analytics, AI and data models, AI policy, including standards, health architecture, and data sharing that examine emerging technology challenges within the federal government, providing recommendations for agencies to become more efficient and cost effective using cutting edge IT solutions and technologies. Um, but thank you everyone again for joining us today and thank you again to Fordrock. Um, and we hope to see you guys next week on our AI and data analytics working group launch. Thanks, thank Alyssa, you everyone. you're awesome. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.